Okay, so we are at the end of the day, and uh, um, this is a great treat to have Carlos here speaking to us about. Shh, sorry, we start now. Thank you. So, speaking to us about soliton revolution for the res revolution. Sorry, Carlos. <laughs> soliton resolution for the energy critical wave equation. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me this uh, opportunity to be here to help celebrate the mathematics of, of Jean Bourguin. Um, it's a great honor for me to, to be doing this. Um, I have the highest regard for Jean Bourguin's mathematics. I think he's a, an amazing mathematician at the historical level. And it really blows my mind to think about all the fundamental contributions that he has made in so many uh, different topics. It's sort of hard to even understand how this is possible. Uh, he's really a, a force of nature. Um, as Gilila was saying, in, in the field of dispersive equations, his work was completely transformative. Um, the first uh, thing, as Gilila said, was his, uh, first of all, int introducing methods that allowed to prove well-postedness results in situations when there is no or very little dispersion, like in uh, compact manifolds or the periodic setting. And at the same time, introduced, he introduced a functional framework that allowed for the proof of such things, even with a very small amount of dispersion. Uh, then he was able to uh, prove the invariance of Gibbs measures and therefore introduced the probabilistic point of view into the subject. He went on to uh, show us a way to, in subcritical problems, prove global well-postedness in, in the absence of conservation laws. And uh, then the, the last thing I, I would like to mention was uh, a work that he did in the late 90s uh, in which he proved for the nonlinear energy critical Schrodinger equation in the radial defocusing case that one had global well postedness and scattering. Um, this work is uh, very important. It, it led to the corresponding work in the non-radial case by the I team, uh, Coleander, Kiel, Stafilani, Takao, and Tao, and it also led to the work that Frank Merrill and I did on the concentration compactness uh, methods for uh, global well postedness of uh, critical dispersive equations. So, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today has its origin in those works. So, um, So uh, our goal now is to try to understand the global dynamics for large solutions of nonlinear dispersive equations. So we'd like to uh, exit the perturbative regime if we can and analyze wh what happens to a solution of nonlinear dispersive equation when you have, a, when it's very large, and uh, for a long time. So I think that the beginnings of the attempt to understand these issues goes back to the mid-60s in a, a numerical work, computational work of Savusky and Kruskal, who were the first to detect in the context of the KDV equation what we now refer to as the soliton resolution conjecture. So, uh, 
since then, there's been a, a, a widely held belief that uh, modulated solitons and uh, radiation can be used to completely describe the long time asymptotics of solutions to uh, nonlinear dispersive and hyperbolic equations. And uh, this is a belief that's referred to as the soliton resolution conjecture. And this is not exactly a conjecture, it's a collection of conjectures, uh, which depends on which problem you're studying. So this I find to be a very beautiful uh, statement because you, you have these solutions to these uh, nonlinear equations, which in principle could be very chaotic and very wild. But the statement asserts that if you wait long enough, things simplify. And then the solution looks like the superposition of uh, well understood or hopefully well understood simpler nonlinear objects like the traveling waves or solitons and a, a radiation term which is nothing more than a solution to the associated linear problem. Okay. So uh, until recently th there hasn't uh, been much rigorous mathematics to prove this. It had been done in uh, some integrable regimes. So those uh, integrable equations are nonlinear equations which can be solved by a reduction to a collection of linear equations. And otherwise in perturbative regimes, either for small solutions or for solutions close to a traveling wave and so on. Uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, and as I was saying this was inspired by, by the work o of Bourguin and also the work of the I-team that I mentioned earlier. And this followed the program that we had at the Institute that Giliola mentioned in 2003, 2004. Uh, we developed with Frank Merrill the concentration compactness rigidity theorem method, which was designed to study the long time behavior of solutions to critical dispersive equations and uh, this was a, a method that uh, was, would work in, this, in uh, defocusing problems. I will be more precise about that. And below the energy of the ground state in uh, focusing problems. And uh, in studying this, uh, in developing this method, we decided to understand it in the context of the energy critical nonlinear wave equation and we realized that it, it was very well suited for this equation and that there was a chance that uh, nonlinear wave equations was the right setting in which to try to prove soliton resolution in non-integrable situations. So this is, was about 2005 when, when this happened. Uh, after that, uh, in a series of joint works with Thomas Dukaer, we uh, initiated a, a long-term project to investigate whether this was the case or not. And uh, the first major breakthrough came uh, around 2012, 2013, when we were able to establish soliton resolution for the energy critical wave equation in three space dimensions in the radial case. So let me now be more uh, specific and uh, tell you what the energy critical wave equation is. And uh, I'll, I have focusing here, I will explain what that means. So it's the standard linear wave equation minus a nonlinearity, a semi-linear nonlinearity, which has a specific power attached to it. And uh, the data is supposed to be in the space H1 dot, which is simply the space of functions with a gradient in L2. And then the time derivative is just supposed to be in L2. And the dimension is three, four, five, and so on. Dimension two is different because we have N minus two here, okay, in the denominator. Um, 
This uh, uh, nonlinear wave equation was devised as a model to approximate uh, geometric problems like the wave map problem. And I will, and of course, uh, eventually the Einstein equations, but I will get back to this uh, connection with the wave maps equations in a few minutes. So in, in this lecture, I will stick to the three-dimensional case, but the results extend to other dimensions too. I, I don't want to. So let me, uh, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I need to backtrack a little bit. This equation is called uh, focusing because minus the Laplacian is a positive operator and the, the nonlinearity has a minus in front of it. So there is a competition between the nonlinear term and the uh, linear Laplacian. Now both of those terms scale the same way and so it is not clear which one will win. And that's part of the interest of the problem. Now in the case when this sign instead of being minus is a plus, then the nonlinearity and the, and the Laplacian have the same sign and so they cooperate with each other. And we, that's what we call the defocusing case. That case was studied much earlier in the mid 80s, 90s and early 2000s. And you can see it was a period of like 20 years when these problems were studied. And there was a very intensive work on this by people like uh, Struve, Grilakis, Chata and Struve, uh, Chata uh, and Bahuri and uh, Bahuri and Girard and uh, several others. Kapitansky can be mentioned here too. And one can summarize the, this huge body of work by the following statement. Any data in H1 cross L2 gives rise to a solution that exists for all time and the asymptotics as time tends to infinity of the solutions are the same as the asymptotics of the corresponding linear equation. And that's what we call scattering. So this is the summary of these 20 years of research. So, uh, and now we want to understand what happens in the case when the nonlinearity and the linear part compete. So let me go back to this slide where what I want to say is that small data always yield uh, global solutions which scatter, that is asymptotic, asymptotically in time, they behave like a linear solution. And then for large data, we can solve for a little while. And there's always a maximal interval of existence. And what, what is this maximal interval of existence and what happens at the end of it is part of what we want to study. And now there's an auxiliary space to which the solution belongs, which is this space which we call the, uh, the Strickert space. And I don't want to say more about it, but it's the belonging to the Strickert state space that decides whether your solution scatters or doesn't. Okay, so it's uh, intimately connected with scatter. So why do we call this the energy critical equation? Uh, the energy norm is critical because if you have a solution U and you remember we're in th the 3D case, the nonlinearity in 3D is U to the 5 as in Andreas talk. And uh, if you have a solution and you rescale it in this way, that is still a solution and the, nor and the norm in the energy space of the initial data doesn't change. So you cannot make it big or small by varying lambda. Okay. Now there's a, a conserved quantity for this equation, which is the, uh, the nonlinear energy that we see here. There's a linear part of the energy and then there's a nonlinear part of the energy and there's a minus sign. And that's a consequence of the focusing character of the equation. In the defocusing case, instead of minus, you have a plus. So there's a competition, that's what uh, gives you a hint of the competition between the uh, linear and nonlinear parts. 
for, for example, in the defocusing case, for free you get that the H1 cross L2 norm doesn't grow by the conservation of the energy. Okay. Now, uh, uh, let me start showing you why the uh, focusing case is, dif is different. And the first thing you, you notice is that, let's forget about the space derivatives and write the ODE. If you write the ODE, this function, one minus T to the minus a half with this appropriate constant, is a solution. And obviously it becomes infinite at time one. So something blows up. Now you could say, well, but initially this is not in H1 cross L2, but you can chop it off because in the a uh, wave equation, there's finite speed of propagation, so which if we chop it off initially in a box of radius uh, two, uh, at time one, we will still see blow up and it will be in the energy space. Okay, so there are solutions that have the property that as you approach the final time of existence, the norm blows up and this we call type one blow up. Okay. This it's a name, there's type one and there's type two. Unfortunately, they're not exclusive. So there's a, a little bit of a trick here, okay. Now this equation is an energy critical equation and it happens to have also type two blow up solutions. That is to say solutions, uh, I forgot to write less than infinity here. <laughs> so solutions for which the energy critical norm remains bounded until the finite time of existence. Well, you say, wait, why is that the final time of existence? What happens to your solution? What happens to the solution is that the, the gradient square concentrates like a Dirac mass at the blow up point. And therefore, it, the flow cannot be continu continued continuously. Okay, so that's what happens in this case. The constructions, uh, uh, the first construction was in the three-dimensional case in work of Krieger, Schlag and Totaro. Uh, then there was a, a four-dimensional uh, construction due by Ilere and Raphael. And uh, recently, uh, Jacek Gendrej has constructed solutions in dimensions five and six. And so remember that the, the way that the solution breaks down is by concentration. And of course, type one and type two are not mutually exclusive because it could be that along a sequence of time, the H1 cross L2 norm remains bounded and in another sequence of times, it goes to plus infinity. So that's what we call mixed asymptotics and that's a possibility a priori. Okay. Now, uh, there's also solutions that exist for all time, but which do not scatter. And this is a, another interesting phenomenon that occurs for these equations. For, for example, we can forget now about the time derivative. Before we forgot about the space derivative, let's forget about the time derivative. So there are solutions which are not zero to this uh, nonlinear elliptic equation, Laplacian Q plus Q to the fifth equal to zero. And by making them constant in time, you get a, a solution to the nonlinear wave equation. Now, these solutions do not scatter because if a solution scatters and if you confine it in space, so you integrate on a box of size one and the gradient squared, let's say, and you let T go to infinity, that has to go to zero for a scattering solution. And these ones don't change in time, so they, they cannot be scattering solutions. Now, what are examples of solutions to this nonlinear elliptic equation? By the way, this is a, an equation that was extensively studied because of its connection with the Yamabe problem in, in differential geometry, the, the problem of trying to, given a compact uh, manifold, find a conformally equivalent metric which has constant scalar curvatures. And the solution of the Yamabe problem was accomplished by the study of this uh, elliptic equation. Uh, a, a specific example of solution to this equation is what we call W of X. And it's given by this formula, one plus X squared over three to the power minus one half. 
So a very simple function that solve this nonlinear uh, elliptic equation. And of course, you can translate, you can rescale it respecting the equation, and you can change sign because uh, power five is odd, so that also gives you a solution. Now, uh, the work on this elliptic equation revealed that this W is the only radial solution to this elliptic equation. This is a work of Gidas, Nee, and Nirenberg. And uh, it's only, oh, I'm sorry, no, th this is work of Pohorzhaev combined with work of Gidas, Nee, and Nirenberg. And uh, uh, the fact that it's the only non-negative solution is the, the work of Gidas, Nee, and Nirenberg. Okay. And uh, we call this the ground state because among all the non-zero solutions to the elliptic equation is the one which has smallest energy. Okay, so it's a non-linear ground state. So these solutions are bounded in time because they don't change in time and they don't scatter. Now there's other constructions of bounded non-scattering solutions which have much more complex behavior at time infinity than these ones, which essentially don't do anything. And uh, the constructions of this were uh, made by Krieger and Schlag, Doninger and Krieger, Marte more recently by Martel, Merle, and Jendrich. Now there's other uh, examples of non-scattering solutions which we should uh, point out, and those are the traveling wave solutions. After all, if we want to study soliton resolution, we need traveling wave the solutions to the elliptic equations are traveling waves that don't travel, right? They stay put, okay? So they travel with speed zero. Now, uh, for each vector of length one, uh, length less than one, strictly less than one. By the way, the speed of light and the, this uh, formalism is one. So when we talk about L less than one, we mean, we mean something strictly slower than the speed of light. And then there's traveling wave solutions, which are solutions which don't uh, change in shape, but just translate in the direction of a vector L, which is an arbitrary vector of length less than one, which are obtained from the uh, static solutions by means of Lorentz transformations. And I've written the formula. I don't expect you to pay attention to the formula. But what you do is you take a, a static solution, you view it as a solution of the nonlinear wave equation, you apply the space-time Lorentz transformation, and you obtain a traveling wave solution. Okay? And this is the explicit formula. It's important to, for further uh, notice that the speed is always strictly less than one in this ones. In, in a work in uh, uh, a few years ago with Ducaire and Merrill, we showed that these are all the traveling wave solutions for the nonlinear wave equation. So uh, if you have a solution in the traveling wave form of the nonlinear wave equation, then necessarily the speed has to be less than one and the solution has to be the Lorentz transform of a static solution. Okay. The fact that the speed has to be less than or equal to one is more or less clear from finite speed of propagation. The fact that it is strictly less than one uses again the Pohorzhaev identity. And then the, there's some extra work to show that it has to come from a solution to the elliptic equation by the Lorentz transformation. Okay. So if you think about what soliton resolution says, in the case of the nonlinear wave equation, it can only hold for solutions whose H1 plus L2 norm remains bounded in time up to the final time of existence. That's because solutions of the linear equation have this property, Solitary waves have this property, and when you modulate them, uh, you maintain this property, okay? So if we want soliton resolution, we have to restrict our attention to that, okay? 
Now, it, it, it is useful to define also something that in, in case we have finite time blow up, we call a singular set. Basically, the singular set is a set of points where you cannot continue the, even locally, the solution to the nonlinear wave equation. Okay? So here is a precise definition, but it, you just cannot push it further even locally. Okay? And uh, we showed with the Kyra and Merrill that this set, I I if T plus is finite, this is always non empty, but it's always finite if we have boundedness of the H1 cross L2 norm. Okay? Now that immediately implies that if we have a radial solution, it can only be the origin because the sphere has infinitely many points and they're undistinguishable. Okay? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in 2012, we proved soliton resolution uh, in both for radial solutions in n equals three for both the case t plus is finite and t plus is infinite along a well-chosen sequence of times, while in uh, 13 we were able to show it for all sequences of times. Okay. Now the key idea in this proof was the use of something we call channels of energy, which had, we had introduced early and which describes what happens that produces soliton resolution. So soliton resolution can only happen in unbounded spatial domains. And what happens is that as you approach the singularity, energy gets ejected towards spatial plus infinity. And what you need to find is a mechanism, a mathematical mechanism for this to hold. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to prove this. And the mechanism that we found is this so, uh, uh, channel of energy uh, method that I'll explain in a minute. So th there's a fundamental fact underlying this, which is a dynamical characterization of the ground state. Remember, the ground state is the only static solution that's radial. Okay? And uh, so if you have a radial bounded solution and it exists for all times, and it is not zero, not an interesting solution, or plus or minus the ground state, then there's a channel of energy that gets uh, shipped all the way to time plus infinity, either for positive time or for negative time. So somehow you always find energy outside this expanded light cone either for positive time or for negative time. And this is the, th the thing that shows what happens to in the ejection of energy. There's always, unless you're W, there's always energy. For W, this fails. And you can calculate that from the formula that I gave. Okay? So how did we prove this? The proof relied on something we call outer energy lower bounds, which is a property of radial solutions of the linear wave equation in three dimensions, which uh, could have been proved by D'Alembert. It's at, at that level. It's a very elementary thing. And it tells you that if, if you have a, a solution now of the linear wave equation, for all t positive or for all t negative, for any r not bigger than zero, there is always a channel of energy provided this quantity is non-zero. And if you understand what this quantity is, it's basically the energy norm, except that here the r is inside the DDR instead of being outside the DDR. And this is precisely what kills W. If you take the Newtonian potential, one over R, and you multiply it by R, you get one, and so that derivative is zero. Basically, that's the, that's the point of uh, uh, stating this condition like this. And the, the proof of this is truly elementary. Okay? It's a one page, and it's a completely explicit. 
So how, how does this help us in proving soliton resolution? Let's try to do this at time, uh, in the finite time of existence case, which is t plus equal one. Then the first thing you do is you're gonna extract the radiation term. The radiation term is easy to extract in the finite time blow up situation. What you show is that, okay, my solution remains bounded up to the blow up time, so I can extract the weak limit. And I can prove that the weak limit exists for whatever sequence of times I get. And then I look at the nonlinear solution with data at t equals one equal to the weak limit. And that will, we call the regular part of the solution. And when we take the, uh, the difference between the regular part and the actual solution, and this is where finite speed of propagation simplifies matters tremendously, the, the difference is supported in the inverted light cone. So all the action, the, act, the bad part of the solution is inside the inverted light cone. And outside, it's just a nice solution like this. So everything happens inside the light cone, and it's clean, okay? Then we, we look at the difference between the, uh, the, uh, the solution and its regular part, and we break it up into blocks. Now, uh, this is a technical thing. It's uh, uh, the nonlinear uh, profile associated to the bahuri R profile decomposition. But just think of it as blocks of solutions to the nonlinear wave equation. Plus a remainder. And the remainder is a sequence of solutions to the linear wave equation. And this sequence cannot be chosen to be small in energy norm, but it's small in a weaker sense. Think of them as going weakly to zero instead of going strongly to zero. Yes, okay. Then what you s look at is, you look at each profile, and if it is not plus or minus W, then because of this uh, channel of energy property, it must be sending energy outside. But the, the U minus V is supported in this cone, and the other one is sending energy here, and that's a contradiction. So each one of these nonlinear blocks has to be plus or minus W. And that's your soliton resolution. Then you're left with a dispersive term. And this dispersive term, you prove that has to go to zero again by the same channel argument. And that's how the soliton resolution proof goes in this case. Of course, I'm making it seem a little bit easier than it is in practice. No, th uh, that's what you prove. It, originally, you have blocks that are nonlinear solutions. If it's a nonlinear solution, which is not the ground state, it shoots energy outside this light cone, and that contradicts the support. Well, then, it has to be. then it has to be, and that's the decomposition. Okay? So that's the argument. Oh, by the way, I, I wanted to say, uh, I didn't mention how you pass from this outer energy inequality for linear solutions to the solutions to the nonlinear problem. The point is that there was a parameter R0 where I, I could choose. If I take R0 very, very large, the tail of my nonlinear solution is very small. Then the, if I cut off away from that tail, the nonlinear solution is almost linear. And so it inherits this energy channel. But then finite speed of propagation tells you that very far away, it equals this cutoff nonlinear solution. And that's why I can get away with it, okay? Right. Okay, so I, I've gone through this. N now I want to explain a little bit the, the proof that worked for just one sequence of times and not for all sequence of times, which is obviously a weaker result, 
But it's interesting because it had ideas that then helped later on. So uh, in, in studying uh, this nonlinear elliptic equations in the 80s, in fact, this was already in the 60s, there was an, a, a very important identity, the Pohozhaev identity, that uh, was used by Pohozhaev to prove that there couldn't be non-zero solutions to certain nonlinear problems. The Pohozhaev identity has a counterpart in hyperbolic problems, and these are what we call the virial identities, okay? And so you use here we used uh, virial identities, and there was another fact that we used, which was, let's think of the uh, finite blow-up case, where I, in the radial case, where everything is happening inside this inverted, uh, inverted light cone. What happens is that the action is not at the boundary of the, of the light cone. At the boundary, it's almost still like a very nice solution. What happens is that the energy has to be concentrating in a sharper a a angle than the uh, cone angle. And that's what we call that there's no self-similar blow up. Okay, so the energy in any, in the region between a slightly smaller cone and the bigger cone goes to zero as you approach the blow up time. So it all happens in, uh, I don't know, but anyway, I think the pictures are more clear. <laughs> anyway, because of these two things, one can show that the Cesaro means of the L2 norm of the time derivative inside the light cone go to zero. Okay? So. That means, essentially, if you are hopeful, that since the time derivatives are going to zero, the solutions are looking like static solutions, right? Because the t derivative is going to zero. If the solutions are static, there's only w there, and that's how you get your solitons. Now, why did you have to choose a very good sequence of times? It's the Tauberian argument. It's the old Tauberian argument that says that if you have Cesaro summability, you can find a subsequence for which you have real summability. Nothing more than that. But that makes you have to pass to a subsequence because we know that it doesn't, it's not true that Cesaro summability implies summability. Right? Okay. So, uh, I have to say, I, I'm going to be a little bit fast now. The argument was generalized to all odd dimensions by my student, Casey Rodriguez, using an extension of his outer energy inequalities that was proved in all odd dimensions by myself, Andy Lorry, Bao Ping Lu, and Wilhelm Schlag. And uh, this was all odd dimensions. Then it was extended, uh, well, or more or less simultaneously. It was extended to dimension four by Cott, myself, Lori, and Schlag. And here, what we, what we used was a certain analogy with wave maps. In the case of, uh, in the, case of the 3D radial nonlinear wave equations, we ruled out in the work with Ducaire and Merrill, cell similar blow up by using, again, this channel of energy methods. In, in the work on wave maps, this was an old fact due to Christodoulou, Christodoulou uh, Tavildar Sadeh and Chata and Tavildar Sadeh. I think Struve also had some input there. And their proof worked by integration by parts. Now, why could they do that? for wave maps and we couldn't do it for the nonlinear wave equation. It's because in the nonlinear wave equation, the energy density cannot, is not necessarily non-negative. There's a minus sign. While for wave maps, the energy density is always non-negative, even though they may be focusing. 
and they are focusing just because of the geometry of the target space. Let's say when the target space is a sphere. But somehow we managed to reverse, and usually one studies wave maps by first studying the nonlinear wave equation, and we somehow reverse that process. We use the wave map information to deduce things about the nonlinear wave equation, and we ruled out cell similar blow up, and that way we got the DDT to tend to zero. Now, the outer energy inequalities that I showed you for the linear wave equation uh, are actually false for all even dimensions. And this was uh, shown by Cott, myself, and Schlag. So we were a little bit stuck, but however, we had shown them that for dimension four, they are true if the time derivative term is zero. And in here, because of this Tauberian argument, the time derivative was zero, and we could use that to finish things off. In dimension six, though, <laughs> something strange happens, and this, this outer energy inequalities are, are true only for data of the form zero and DDT. And then we didn't know what to do. And uh, I'm sorry. Last. Oh, what happened? I'm sorry. Okay. So last year, uh, with Howard Jia, who's a postdoc at Chicago, we were able to uh, carry over the, this decomposition in the radial case for all even dimensions by coming up with, a, for an, with an argument that does not use channels of energy, but which combines two virial identities. So the offshoot of all this is that for the radial case, at least for a well-chosen sequence of times, you do have the decomposition for all times. So the rest of the talk is to, okay, and there were extensions in various works to equivariant wave maps, the defocusing equations with repul repulsive potentials uh, by uh, various people, Wilhelm, was Wilhelm Schlag, participated in all of this, uh, caught, participated in some of them, uh, and so on. Anyway, um, let me continue. So let me now turn to the non-radial case, which has been treated in, in recent works of GIA and, and uh, DKM16, and then a, a joint paper with GIA, uh, Ducard, Kenning, and Merle. Okay. So what are the new difficulties in the non-radial case? First of all, the set of traveling waves is very poorly understood. We don't know what all the solutions to the nonlinear elliptic equation are. We know that there are variable sign solutions. Those were constructed by Ding already in 85, and uh, more recently, um, other authors have constructed more explicit examples. I I'll get to that in a minute. So this is a, a very, very large family of traveling waves, and we don't know what they look like, okay? There's no classification. Second thing that happens is that these outer energy inequalities are false in the non-radial case. Um, certainly, th uh, they fail, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the radial case, but in odd dimensions, they also fail in the non-radial case. So this approach, which was based on a dynamical classification of traveling waves, uh, is doomed to failure. So and something else had to be done. So uh, before stating precisely the result, I want to I'll make a few comments on the radiation term. So when t, is t plus is finite, so we know that the singular set is finite and non-empty, and we show that the weak limit exists. And it turns out this holds also in the non-radial case. In that case, there could be a finite number, but many singular points. And then w what you have is the support property, but not just, not in one cone, but in the union 
of this finitely many inverted cone centered uh, around each singular uh, point. And this is, this is what the radiation term looks like in the finite time blow up term. Uh, for the infinite time case, the construction of the radiation case, uh, of the radiation term is much more delicate. And uh, so suppose U is a solution, T plus is infinite and the norm is bounded, then uh, uh, this was done um, last fall, we, we or finished last fall, we extracted what we call the scattering profile of U. So the largest linear solution that's close to you. And what we showed was that, first of all, if you look at the linear solution at time minus T, and you apply it to the solution at time T, that always has a weak limit. The weak limit is V0, V1, and when we look at the linear solution with, with that data, that approximates our, our nonlinear solution at the finite distance away from the light cone. So again, everything is happening strictly inside the light cone. Okay. And as I was saying, the, the construction of this uh, object is, is delicate. So uh, here I summarize the arguments, but uh, we have to take it with a grain of, uh, of salt here. The key idea is that we use, a, again, a combination of virial identities to show that there are no blocks. There are no nonlinear profiles which remain close to the boundary of the light cone. And this makes sense because, as we saw, the nonlinear objects are the traveling waves, and the traveling waves are going with speed less than one. So they will not be close to the boundary of the light cone. Okay. And so we, we, this is how, how this is. So now let me state uh, the theorem. I mean, this is a, a bit of a, a bit of a handful here. So what this means basically is let's look at the finite time blow up case. We look at a, a fixed point in the singular set then near that point, there is a soliton resolution. The, the modulated uh, traveling waves are here, and they do not see each other because of this condition on the parameters. That means that they don't interact with each other, and they're traveling in, in directions Lj, which can be obtained from the sequence of times and the translation parameters, and there's also the scaling parameters. So for a well-chosen uh, sequence of times, we do have this soliton resolution. But the soliton resolution only holds sufficiently near the singular point, because if you go too far, you might hit the other singular points. So you have to stay away from the other singular points. No, no, no. We use the, the, that they solve the elliptic equation and that there are Lorentz transforms of that. Uh, and that they are Lorentz transforms of solutions of the elliptic equation. I w what, uh, what do I think? Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll say a little bit, okay? Of how you do this. And then, uh, the next part of the theorem is the infinite time case. And then, of course, there is this uh, radiation term. And after you extract the radiation term, you get a similar decomposition. Okay? For a well chosen, again, sequence of time. So this is the soliton resolution for arbitrary bounded solutions of the nonlinear wave equation, but for a well chosen sequence of time. So let me just say a few words about the, the proof in the remaining 10 minutes, okay? So the first thing I want to say is that the finite time blow up case was proven by Jian. But he had a weaker uh, condition on the error, which I is basically that it only tended to zero in the weak dispersive sense. 
So he was able to do the decomposition in the finite time blow up case, but with an error going to zero in the dispersive sense, not in the strong sense. The, uh, the rest of the theorem is in this paper that I just mentioned, which is on the archive, except for the existence of the radiation term, which was done, as I mentioned earlier in this paper. Okay. So let, let me sketch the proof of the, of the decomposition at the finite time blow up case. Okay. Uh, the other proof is analogous once we have the radiation term at our disposal. So now it, it, it is useful here visually to now, instead of having a cone like this, to have a cone like this. So we will assume that zero is a, a, re, a singular point and that the blow up time is zero and our solution exists for positive time. Since we're in the uh, time reversible situation, this makes no difference. It's just visually easier, okay? And the R star is chosen so that this, the, the solution and its regular part are equal for x bigger than t and less than r star, okay? So that we don't bump into the cones from the other singular points. Okay, that's, that's all. And uh, now we're gonna uh, look at time less than some delta, which is smaller than r star. Okay, so the first observation in the proof is that on the boundary of the light cone, my solution and its regular part coincide because they coincide outside. Now this allows us to conclude some regularity of our solution on the boundary of the, of the light cone. And uh, what it, it, it allows us to show is specifically that this, the sixth power of u, u to the six, is integrable up to the blow up point, okay? And this is a simple calculation. Now, this allows us to face, oh, this is, extends the observation in this paper that I mentioned earlier in the radial case to the non-radial case. And what this allows is to control the energy flux. Uh, one of the big problems with the nonlinear wave equation is the fact that the energy density can be negative and therefore when you differentiate the energy out, how the energy changes with T outside of a light cone, when you get the then you get the energy flux integrated along the boundary of the light cone and that's not, uh, you don't know how to control it because it doesn't have a sign. Once we know that u to the six is controlled, remember that u to the six is what's attached with the energy, then you can automatically control the flux. So this gives us this type of control on the boundary of the light cone, where this is the tangential derivative and uh, this is the flux term, okay? This comes from the, this knowledge that u is in L6. So then you exploit once more the analogy with wave maps. In wave maps, there's a crucial identity, which is the so-called Morawitz identity that is used. Now, once you control the flux, you can also control a Morawitz type identity for the nonlinear wave equation. And what that gives you is the following fact. If you integrate this expression here, dx dt over t, points t1, t2, they, they are well separated, don't pay too much attention to that, but the, what you need to pay attention to is that the power here is three-fourths. Three-fourths is smaller than one. If we knew that this quantity inside was merely bounded, we would get the first power of the log because that's the integral of dt over t but we're getting a smaller power. So that means that this is vanishing in some sense as t goes to the blow up time, okay? And this is the key. 
So this is the analog of the DDT vanishing in the radial case. That's what replaces this. It's the fact that this expression vanishes. So then, uh, you know, through some real variable arguments, uh, Tauberian type theorems, you, you get it going to zero even in a stronger form. And from this, you do an, an analysis of the different blocks in this decomposition. And according to, so each block has a space-time center and a scale. We fix a block and if it's centered at time zero and the scaling factor is comparable to the time factor, from this uh, inequality, you have to, you deduce this type of first order equation for the block. This first order equation for the block implies that the, your, the nonlinear solution is self-similar. Now, in, the, in the, our work with Merle on the uh, ground state conjecture, we showed that there are no self-similar solutions. So these guys are killed. Next, you're still centered at zero, but now you're much, much smaller than the time. Then from that inequality, you deduce a different first order equation. This is this first order equation. And this is exactly the first order equation that the traveling way wave has to satisfy. But then we use the result of the Kennig merle that said that all the traveling waves were uh, Lorentz transforms of elliptic solutions. And so we get that. Now, in the end, how do you get rid, how do you finish it? At some point, you have to use a channel of energy argument. But we know that the channel of energy arguments are tricky because the outer energy inequalities are false. But what happens is that after taking out all the solitary waves, all the traveling waves, you, you can show that what remains has some specific structure. It is outgoing, it has almost no tangential energy, and it's concentrated inside the light. And then you prove directly that for that data, there's always an energy channel in the linear equation. So you are not going to examine all solutions to the linear equation, only the, the ones that arise after taking away this, the traveling waves. And for those, you, you corner them very well and for those, you prove that you do have this energy channel. And that finishes the argument. Okay, so uh, of course, the details are not so simple, but this is the, the general idea. And of course, now the problem of passing from one well-chosen sequence of times to a general sequence of times is completely open. And thank you. <laughs>